Pulse Media. A quick warning before we begin. This episode will contain the names of people and places that are entirely fictional, which I'm sure to mispronounce often. I hope you'll find it in your heart to forgive me. Enjoy the show. Between the years when the oceans drank Atlantis and the rise of the sons of Arius, there was an age undreamed of, when shining kingdoms lay spread across the world. Hither came Conan, the Cimmerian, sword in hand. It is I, his chronicler, who knows well his saga. Now let me tell you of the days of high adventure. From Stephen or Else Media, this is Hither Came Conan, treading the jeweled thrones of Hyboria underneath its sneakered feet, one comic book at a time. I'm your host, my name is Stephen, and I am so excited to talk about some Conan comics that I just really can't be bothered to come up with anything clever or fun to say here in the introduction to the episode. So, with no ceremony whatsoever, let's talk about Conan number five from Dark Horse. This issue hit the stands on Wednesday, June the 23rd, 2004. It sports a cover price of $2.99, and it is entitled Ashes of a Great Fire. It was written by Kurt Busick with art by Kerry Nord and Thomas Yates, letters by Richard Starkings and Comic Craft, and the colors were by Dave Stewart. Into the boat! Previously in Conan number four. Conan has finally come to Hyperborea, the very city he had left Sumeria to visit. However, rather than discovering a land of wonders, music, and eternal summer, he found instead a dark and twisted city, ruled by immortal sorcerers, bored by the tedium of everyday life. Sorcerers who enslave the Sumerian, along with his icer companions. With the help of fellow slave Iasmini, Conan hatched a plan to escape. But while exploring the underbelly of the city, he stumbled across the secret of Hyperborea, then killed a couple of guards, and wound up on the run from a pride of lions sent by Lord Ashtiana to hunt down and kill the big barbarian. As issue five opens, the four lions have found Conan beneath the city, and they move in for the attack. I get to fight the lion! The Sumerian youth, barefooted and wearing nothing but his Hyperborean G-string, turns to face the lion's charge. I gotta fight the lion! He recalls the stories he's heard of the animals and knows that in the end, even armed with the sword he took from the guard he killed in the previous issue, he's no match for their speed and ferocity. The lion is in the contract! He fights the lion. And so, dipping and dodging, Conan manages to stay out of reach until eventually one of the great paws swipes him across the chest, tearing into his skin and throwing him across the room, where he slams painfully into the wall and drops the sword. Unarmed and bleeding, and the blood can go spurting in slow motion. Conan does the only thing he can do if he wants to survive long enough to save his friends. And so he jumps out a window, hoping as he does so that there's a rooftop below to break his fall. Meanwhile, in the city above, Lord Ashtiana requests an update from his Chamberlain regarding the intruder situation. The Chamberlain, however, has nothing new to offer, explaining that with the lions running wild, it's been rather difficult for people to go down and gather information without being mauled. And so the Hyperborean has nothing left to do but wait. He sends Iasmini back to her room for the night, and alone with nothing but his thoughts, Ashtiana reminisces on Hyperborea's past. Ashtiana's people, it seems, those he thinks of as the sorcerers of Hyperborea, were not the first to dwell upon and civilize these lands. The original Hyperboreans were little more than cave dwellers, barbarians who fought for their very survival, standing on the clifftops and hurling rocks and stone down upon the packs of massive white gorillas who had come to wipe them out. Eventually, These cave people would use the same rock and stone to build walls to protect them from their enemies. And from behind those walls grew castles and towers and cities. Thus, 
was Hyperborea born. It's alive! Through the years, others would try to take what the Hyperboreans had built, but always the walls protected them and made them strong, made them invincible. But high-strong stone walls mean little against the power of sorcery. For when Ostiana's ancestors came to claim Hyperborea as their own, armed with the arcane knowledge of magic, those who had come before, those who had turned a land of rock and stone into civilization, well, they would die behind those walls, and Ostiana's people would become the new Hyperboreans, ushering in a new era of power in the north. Meanwhile, back in the present, Iasmini returns to her room to find Conan there waiting, his naked chest bleeding from the long, deep gashes left by the lion's mighty claws. She's happy to see him alive and applies a salve to his wounds, which she says will allow them to heal more rapidly. Conan, however, is not concerned. Tis but a scratch. He figures that with a little rest, he'll be tip-top in no time. I ran it under a cold tap. And besides, his tunic will hide the wounds. Iasmini tells Conan that there's no time to rest, that the timetable has been moved up due to Ashtiana's newfound desire to hurl himself into the abyss the following day. She wants to leave now, tonight, but Conan tells her no. He needs more of the leaf so that he can pull his friends out from under their yellow lotus cloud as quickly as possible so that they can all make their escape in the morning and maybe do a little damage on the way out. Meanwhile, Ashtiana continues to mope about his room, and as he holds the skull of his grandfather, he reflects on the past grandeur of Hyperborea. After kicking the original owners out of the city, and with the sorcerers of Hyperborea now in charge, they declare that the city will become a place of learning, where they will unlock not only the secrets of the universe, but the secrets of the gods themselves. As time passes and as the sorcerers settle in, Hyperborea continues to be a place that is prized by others, and it is often that they are forced to fend off attacks from outside forces. But that's cool, because with each invasion that the sorcerers of Hyperborea stop, they are blessed with prisoners that they can use for their dark, arcane experiments, which eventually results in the discovery that allows them to extract the life force from these prisoners and use that power to control the weather and to extend their lives. It's through Ashtiana's nostalgic reflections that we see the very physical nature of the Hyperboreans change, where once they looked like regular folk, now they are gaunt, pale, and short of nose. Back in the present, as the sun rises, Iasmini waits, placing her very fate in the hands of a 16-year-old barbarian. And speaking of Conan, he's in the arena, training with his fellow slaves and watching for any hint that they may be breaking free from the Lotus. He doesn't have to wait long, however, for soon one of the Icer, a man named Tialfi, is out from under the cloud and is, of course, all sorts of confused. Conan is quick to explain their current situation to the man, and soon both of them are watching for the others to follow suit. Meanwhile, Ashtiana recalls the first of the suicides among his people 500 years ago and how it led to a significant shift in their religious beliefs as the suicides became ritualized sacrifices, celebrations that became known as a day of farewell. Farewell, simpleton! Back in the arena, more and more the men of Asgard come out from under the spell of the Lotus until eventually one of the slave handlers notices what's going on and calls out the alarm. Soon, Ashtiana is informed of the uprising happening in the arena. He orders his chamberlain to send in the troops to quell the rebellion. And as the issue comes to an end, as Conan leads the Iser in revolt, calling out to the Hyperboreans that he and his friends are gonna kill them all, Ashtiana stands alone in his room, wondering just where it all went wrong. Holy crap, folks. This is where it pops off. I mean, this series has been great so far, but now it's like it just exploded. And going into this issue, armed with the knowledge imparted to me by Kurt Busick, and of course, imparted to everyone on Blue Sky who read our interaction, I was actually able to get much more enjoyment out of this issue because, I mean, up until this issue, it's like my mind was preoccupied with the Hyperboreans and 
He was wrestling with this question of why they were so different from what we got in the Marvel comics, specifically Conan the Barbarian number three from November of 1970. And I'm sure I've talked about it before, but my neurodivergent brain can sometimes focus on the wrong things when taking in various forms of entertainment. And while that doesn't necessarily stop me from enjoying stuff, it can sometimes muddle or lessen the enjoyment. With this issue, however, once I knew what Kurt Busick was going for, and knowing that he created these Hyperboreans using an educated guess, basically, that this is what Robert E. Howard might have done with the Hyperboreans had he truly ever fleshed out their culture, which he never really did. Well, I just had a goddamn good time with the issue. And with that Busick knowledge and having done my own research and taking all that combined with what little Bob Howard had written about the Hyperboreans, I mean, all the stuff in this issue about the history of Hyperborea, it just came together in a way that, for me at least, was quite satisfying. I demand satisfaction. With that said, we should probably do Stephen's Stephen's favorite favorite bits. All right, we have another cover from Joseph Michael Linzer. It's got Conan fully face on toward the camera. He's got his back to a stone wall. He's crouched. He's got a sword in one hand. His other hand is back against the wall like he's just getting ready to to spring out and kill a bunch of people. It looks like he's cornered, basically. And he's got this look on his face like, fuck, and I'm going to kill every motherfucker that gets in my way. And yet I don't really care for this cover at all. I don't, I don't know. There's just something about it I don't like. First off, if you didn't know any better, you would just assume that Conan is standing here completely buck-ass naked because he's wearing his little Hyperborean G-string, right? We know that from within the issue and the previous issue, but the way the cover is made up, he's got this big shadowy area over his nether regions. His, his chest and his nethers are all blacked out in shadow, so everything of Conan you can see is bare skin and... Because of that, I don't know, one could assume he's just completely naked. Or maybe that's just me. Maybe that's something I need to think about in the dark recesses of my brain while I look at this oily, muscled figure and go, ooh, that man's naked. But it's beautiful. It's a great looking cover. Joseph Michael Linzer is super talented, but I don't know. Conan almost looks like an action figure on the cover because he's all shiny, like he's made out of plastic. Getting into the issue, we have the scene where Conan fights the lions. He fights the lion. And I really enjoyed this bit because, you know, I think some writers would, given the opportunity to have Conan fight four lions, I think some writers would look at that and go, you know what? Conan is a badass. And here's my chance to prove how much of a badass he is, armed only with the sword, practically naked. I'm going to have Conan kill all four of these freaking lions. And Busick didn't go that route. He went the route that seems more real. You know, Conan is a badass, but these are freaking lions and there's four of them. One lion, sure. We've seen Conan go up against a single lion before and prevail, but four of them, I don't think so. And Conan does the smart thing here and he jumps out the window. And there's kind of a good line here when he does so where the narrator is saying, Already his skin was torn, his blade lost, and such was the lion's speed. There was only one hope, and he knew Krom does not answer prayers. And so he prayed to Emir that there would be a rooftop below. I like that about Conan. You know, he has a god. He has a religion. But Krom is just this crusty old man that sits atop his mountain, and he just doesn't give a fuck about anybody. He's like, hey, you got yourself in this mess, buddy. Get yourself out of it. I'm not going to help you. I don't know what Krom did. I don't know if their belief is that Krom created the world and put them upon it and then just said, all right, have at it. It's all yours, which, you know, feels kind of familiar. But the fact that Conan feels this need to pray to a god and knowing that his god isn't going to answer or isn't going to help is just basically going to ignore him. He just chooses a different god, and I I dig that about Conan. Hither Came Conan will return after these messages. 
Is this what your podcast sounds like? There's this persistent background noise behind you, such as an air conditioner or a fan, and the audio itself, well, it sounds a bit tinny. Well, how about I do something about that? First, let's remove that fan in the background. Now let's beef up the audio a bit. This is what I can do for you. My name is Stephen Orr. I have over a decade of experience recording and editing my own podcasts, and I want to put those skills to work for you. So tell me, do you love podcasting but hate editing? Do you have a number of episodes recorded but just can't find the time to get them edited and ready for release? Do you need help and you're not sure what to do? Well, come talk to me. I can remove that background noise. I can reduce silences. I'll remove all of your ums and your uhs, as well as your throat clearings, sneezes and coughs and such. And I can even add your music and whatnot. And hey, my prices are quite reasonable. Check out edityourpod.com to get started. That's edityourpod.com. Or just reach out to me directly. Email edityourpod at gmail.com. Tell me what you need, and I'll tell you how I can help. And more importantly, quote you a cost. EditYourPod.com. Get started today. And now back to Hither Came Conan. I love Iasmini in her. I don't know if you'd call it, I guess, slave garb. It's her, you know, the way she's dressed, the, the she's all done up, you know, to be there for her master, Ashtiana. But when we see her outside of her duties, you know, she's wearing a see-through gown. Her hair is down around her shoulders. She looks very sexy. And here she just looks adorable because she's got her hair back and she's got this thing that goes up around her head. So just her, her little moon-shaped face peeks out and she looks adorable. But I really enjoyed some of my favorite bits here in this issue were all the flashbacks, the the historical flashbacks that told us how Hyperborea came to be. And my favorite page so far, because I know there's another one coming up that may make me change my mind, but this page with the great white apes climbing the cliffs, going for these cavemen like Hyperboreans and they're throwing the stones down on top of them. This is a this is a great page. The apes look freaking terrifying. We turn the page, there's a moment after the new Hyperboreans, the ancestors of Ashtiana, once they take over, one of them is taking off their helmet because we see them storming the castle and their faces are covered. So, I don't know, maybe there's a part of us as the reader who's thinking that They're going to look like they look now, but one of the guys takes off his helmet and he's blonde and he's just gorgeous looking. And he's got this cocky look on his face like, hey, ladies, I am here. Let's go do some surfing, moon doggy. That's what he looks like. He looks like a cocky surfer guy. During the conversation that Conan has with Iasmini about whether or not they should leave right away because she explains to him that Ashtiana is going to do the big leap. Tomorrow. And of course, she's got to go with him. The second page at the very bottom, Conan is angry. He's angry at her because he wants, to, he's, he's telling her he's not leaving without his friends. That's just not going to happen. And he is just sitting there on the bed in the very last panel, just this intense glare on his face. One of his fists are clenched. And that's, that's a great looking panel. That's one of my favorite bits. That's a good bit. We get more of the origin of Hyperborea and learn. That the Hyperborean sorcerers discovered how to extract the life force from the many soldiers who tried to storm the walls of Hyperborea and take it for themselves. And then they used that life force to power all the magical stuff in their land. It keeps the weather warm and it keeps them alive forever, or at least alive as as long as they're willing to stay alive. And then we see Ashtiana change from how he looked originally to how he looks now over the years. And he was a blonde looking surfer dude at one point too. They call them the big kahuna. But he's thinking back, he's, you know, he's reminiscing, he's feeling nostalgic about the old days and how they found this power 
by extracting the life force of others. And they have used that not only to extend their lives, because at the time for them, it wasn't just about extending their lives. It was about having more time to study and learn new things and create new things. And despite the fact that they are earning all of this knowledge by sending out their big mutated soldier dudes to to steal people from their villages and bring them back to Hyperborea to either become slaves or to be experimented on, they felt that what they were doing was a very noble thing. But now, as he's reached that point in his life where he's just getting tired of it all, that he is wondering if maybe, eh, is that really the case? We go to the arena where Conan is practicing with all the other slaves. He's the only one, of course, that's awake and out from under the cloud of the Lotus. There's a really great panel at the bottom of the first page of this bit here where we return to the arena and to the slaves. And it's just Conan. It's just his face. Just some more really great art. Conan is wearing his tunic to cover his wounds, the big claw marks on his chest. But the tunic almost looks... I don't know. It almost looks like an afterthought. Like maybe, I I don't know. I don't think that Carrie Nord forgot to draw it on, but it's, it's just so skin tight that, uh, it almost looks like Dave Stewart came along and said, Hey, remember he's supposed to be wearing a tunic, but that, I mean, that can't be the case because there are other panels where the tunic looks like it's been drawn in and doesn't look like it's just been colored in. I enjoyed the bit where we learn how the whole day of farewell came about that just one of the Hyperboreans one day was just like, you know what? I'm getting kind of tired of this and leaps from the walls into the abyss. And then as more and more of them start to understand why this guy did this, they decide that they're probably going to do that too. It ends up being turned into a, a whole ceremony and they build this bridge to nowhere for them to jump off of. And as Ashtiana is thinking about this, it dawns on him that, as he puts it, it's only been 500 years ago that the first dude committed suicide. Only 500 years ago. But to him, it feels like eternity, which I guess that speaks to how bored he is. Oh, I get so bored. I get so bloody bored. But we'll move on to the best bit in the entire issue. And that's when the revolt begins and Conan is urging the Icer on and they are just, they're showing these Hyperboreans why you don't mess with the men of the North. And there's a moment here where Conan has a smile on his face as he's lopping some guy's head off. Crush your enemies, see them driven before you, and they hear the lamentation of the women. And the final panel of Conan, as we are, at, you know, once we're on the last page, The final panel on the page is Ashtiana looking out his window, wondering where it all went wrong. But the panel above it is Conan fighting alongside the Icer and telling the Hyperboreans that they are going to kill them all. That's probably my most favorite panel in this issue. It's a very nice looking panel. It's very dramatic. You feel this sense of, hell yes, kill these slave owning sons of bitches and get yourself out of there. And then it ends. And uh, you're left feeling a bit empty. All in all, it was a great issue. It might be my favorite of the first five so far, if only because we got to see the origins of Hyperborea and the opening blows of this revolt that will get Conan out of this evil city. And again, I've read this before. I just don't remember exactly how it ends. I know, obviously, that Conan makes it out alive. But as far as the rest of them, I don't know if Njord makes it out. I don't know if Iasmini makes it out. I don't know if any of the Icer make it out. I know that Conan does, but beyond that, I'm really clueless. I'm going into this next issue with no expectations and no idea what's going to happen next, except, of course, that our main man makes it out. I just don't know how, and I don't know what's going to happen to facilitate that. But Such a good series so far. This, I think, at least these first few issues, these first six issues or so of Conan from Dark Horse, these Carrie Nord, Kurt Busiek, 
Dave Stevens, Richard Starkings, Thomas Yates issues. I think if you had them on hand and if anybody came up to you and said, hey, I'm thinking of reading Conan comics, where should I start? This is what you should hand them. I mean, what they're doing over with the Titan books, what Jim Zub is doing with the Titan books, they're good. They're great. They're fun. It's great stuff and I'm loving it. But I think as far as a good introduction, not only to Conan, but Hyboria in general, I don't know. I think that this series would be a good place to start, or at least these first six to seven issues. And I, for one, am enjoying the hell out of it. How about you? Feedback at HitherCameConan.com. And those folks were my favorite bits. And that means I have nothing left to say about Conan number five from Dark Horse Comics. Everybody out! Next week, we jump back into the Titan run with Conan the Barbarian number nine from Heroic Signatures and Titan Comics. It's the start of their third arc. It picks up right from the cliffhanger ending of issue number eight, and it is entitled The Age Unconquered Part One, Suffer Not the King of Wonders. But before we go, I encourage anyone who has yet to give the show a rating over at Apple Podcasts to please do so now as it does help others find the show. And in the end, that's what we all want, right? More people joining our community, sending in emails, letting their opinions known, asking questions, commenting on previous episodes, and all that stuff. So yeah, if you can, leave that rating at Apple Podcasts. You don't have to leave a review to leave a rating, but... If you want to leave a review as well, I'm not going to discourage you from doing so. And since I brought it up, feedback at hithercameconan.com is the email address you want to use if you want to write into the show and possibly have that email read out on a future episode. But remember, if you don't want me to read it out or you don't want me using your full name or anything, when I do read it out, just let me know in the email. Until then, folks, keep your swords close by, never stop treading them jeweled thrones, and most importantly, be nice to each other. Bye. I want to thank you for listening to this episode of Hither Came Conan. Questions and comments can be directed to feedback at hithercameconan.com or come join us on social media. Just look for at Conan Podcast on Twitter and Blue Sky and at Hither Came Conan on Instagram, Threads, and Facebook. If you enjoyed today's episode, please rate the show over at Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening. Donations to the show can be made at donate.hithercameconan.com or become a member of the Super Secret Stephen Society and get episodes early and ad-free. Join now using the link in the show notes or go to secretsociety.hithercameconan.com. Memberships start at just a dollar a month. Many wars and feuds did Conan fight. Honor and fear were heaped upon his name. In time, he became a king by his own hand. This story shall also be told. Blah, 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 blah. My cat, one of my mini cats who likes to hang out atop the laptop where it's warm, spend his day, sleep, he's old. He has been sneezing all over my shit, and I swear every couple days I have to take Clorox wipes to this crap, and it gets old, folks. Older than old. (laughs) Try to get ready. (laughs) Okay. Here we go. Here we go. I I can't really be bothered to try and come up with something clever or even fun to say here during this, the introduction part of the episode. It sports a cover price of $2.99 and in it, I, 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 it was written by Kurt Busick with art by Kerry Nord and Thomas Yates. Yates, Yates, never had a chance to love you. I only want to be around you as you do your artist stuff. That was not creepy at all. It was written by Kurt Busick with art by Kerry Nord and Thomas Yates. Fake sting. 
ruled by immortal sorcerers. As issue five opens, the four lions have found Conan beneath the city and they move in for the attack. The Sumerian youth, barefooted and wearing nothing but his hype. It's going to be one of those episodes. This is going to be one of those episodes. You know why? Because I actually recorded it yesterday, but got interrupted and never got to finish. And rather than go from where I stopped, I decided to delete it and start right over. Because I'm a dumbass. A dumbass. A d d d d d dumbass. After kicking the original owners out of the city and with the sorcerers of... I just don't think I can move through life knowing that a guy named Steven did this to me. How could you let this happen, Steven? Your podcast sucks. Enough talk. 